Hello everyone, uh, thank you for being here for this conversation with uh, Shao Wanlin. Uh, Stefan Shao is born in uh, 1980 in uh, Malaysia. Uh, Hui Lin born in 1980 as well in Singapore. And um, they are working in Beijing, and I've been to Beijing. Uh, Stefan Shaw is uh, a visual artist, and uh, Hui Lin, uh, you have a background in economic policy. You are graduate uh, from the Tsinghua University in MIT Slow School International MBA program. And what is what we are going to discuss today is also your reference or your methodology to praxis. Uh, in reference to uh, statistical, uh, mathematical, computer, comp uh, computer wise technique to um, analyze global issues since uh, 2010. Uh, the project is, uh, we are going through this poverty line project. Uh, uh, we know each other since now, I think like uh, um, 2017, we met the first time in China. Uh, your work has been exhibited in Arles, so during the festival in 2021, uh, but also in uh, really several, a lot of museums. And at this time, there is a wonderful series of the Poverty Line book it at MoMA, the Tomato series. Uh, I've seen it last week. I was really impressed to discover it in the new hanging of the museum. So, what, um, so we have the two uh, editions. So you were part of the uh, Luma Discovery Award in 2019. You won it. Um, and this book was uh, published also with a uh, fundraising and the help of IAM as well. So what you, our like, founder is here with us today. Thank you so much. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a French and an English version. Um, we uh, had, uh, so two for two days ago, first uh, this discussion about like your project and you told me that this is an ongoing project over 10 years and uh, could you maybe let us know because you told me it's also a key project so for what was uh, following as we met together I saw another work uh, which was we are maybe going to this work later on called fish footprint but this was a kind of like generic work to start to work on uh, the notion of poverty. How did you start and why did you start on this topic right now? Um, thank you very much for the in kind introduction. Um, and we're really, really happy to be here today um, to share the story about creating our work and our, our practice going forward. Um, so yes, this, this the poverty line really brought us very incidentally into the path of um, creating art. And um, like our backgrounds are, are quite different. Um, myself, I was training economics and little business administration. Um, Stefan is a photographer. Um, and we were just very curious individuals. And as a couple, we discussed a lot of the issues that we're concerned about. Um, so back in 2010, um, we, we were discussing a lot about um, social phenomena and uh, in particular poverty and inequality that we saw um, where we're living in China, in different parts that we visited. Also back in uh, Singapore and Southeast Asia and where we visited America or Europe uh, and India and so on. And we realized that you know such social phenomena are, are really um, in a way universal but yet also very localized in the context. Um, and we wanted to understand ourselves um, how what, what, what does it mean to be poor? Um, how is it defined locally? And what we found was that each country has its own definition of poverty. And so we basically used um, the country's definition of poverty um, that we researched on, and we divided it per person per day to get an amount of money. And using that amount of money, we bought food items um, that were worth that amount of money. And we also bought the newspapers of the day, and we placed the food items on the newspapers. And that kind of brought us into a creative conversation about what that meant. Is it enough? Does it, it, does it look good? You know, th does the food, is, is the food appealing? And I think food has a certain way um, to connect us. Um, and we were just using that as an experiment um, to think about this issue further. And um, I think for me, um, it also feels that when there is an idea, and I think this idea has been um, 
floated around between Lynn and I. So um, we have been a couple since we were, we started dating when we were 19 years old. We are now in our 40s. And um, so a lot of those years was spent knowing each other. And there were a lot of conversations that we were having. And one of the topics that kept on coming up over those years were our concerns, our personal concerns. And somehow the topic about poverty, about inequality, sort of came up all the time. And I was training as a photojournalist, and I saw the power of what photography can do. Uh, what I find really charming uh, about photography, so a little bit about my background, um, I started photography when I was training um, as part of the Singapore team to climb Everest. And so I spent about three years training full time um, up in the mountains. And during then, my focus was really about climbing the mountain, but I was also given the role of being a photographer. And what I realized is that um, to Singaporeans, um, for, for those who have not been to Singapore, it's a small island with 5.5 million people. The highest peak is 163 meters, which is not really high. It's lower than some buildings around here in Paris. And, um, so, and it's on an equatorial climate, so it's all summer. And people sweat wearing a t-shirt and shorts. Yet, we were training to climb the highest mountain in the world, and um, where the ambient temperature is minus 38 degrees Celsius. And so, words and description can only go so far. Whereas when you show people a photograph, I realize that it really speaks to the experience that one would have. And I think that is during that whole journey where I realized that the power of photography is also the power of language, is the power of communication. And so eventually when I became a professional, coupled with all these conversations I was having with uh, Lynn, I think this project sort of conceived about in the sense that we wanted to put our curiosity into this project, but we also wanted to use another medium to, to explain what it really means. And I think for us, that medium of choice is photography. I think what would be very interesting also for the public, because we know the books, I think it would be nice if the two books could maybe go around the public, just to realize, uh, because what you say about photography, um, uh, it's very, Interesting. How did you did you work to define this process? Because I know you are economist, since you have all these tools to analyze the society and the economic uh, uh, facts. And how did you come to this? In fact, so straight rules to make this photograph to define so what you are looking for and what was the process? And uh, the process and we. In the second step, maybe it would be also interesting to know how aesthetically you define uh, your modus operandi. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, I think there's two ways to explain the, the thought process uh, of how 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 we wanted uh, how we arrive at this this visual that um, uh, some of you are seeing right now. Um, essentially, it is a top-down view of food on newspapers. Um, the point of view is not unique in the sense that this is something that we may see. You know, even when we see our lunch, when we see our food, uh, except that it's on a plate, but. Back in Asia, and I know that even in Europe, uh, in early times, uh, when you go to a local market, they would use to put food on newspapers. So this is not a perspective that is truly unique. And I think what we wanted to do when we created this project was that I saw the power of photography, but I also saw the limitations of how information was spreading so much. Um, there was a project, was it by um, Eric um, um, Cassels? Eric Cassels? Yeah. On uh, how, 
how many images are generated uh, in a single day. And he could fill an entire room with photos that was printed small size. On, on the Flick database, yes, exactly. And, 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 and that's the amount of photography that you would generate in a single day. And you're not just talking about news photography or photography that is taken on a very official level. We have entered an internet age, right, where selfies, taking pictures of our lunches, taking pictures of mundane things. And there has been this grabbing for attention. And suddenly working as a photojournalist in, uh, in, in those days became a challenge because you feel that you're doing something that documents part of history. But that part of history becomes highlighted. Maybe used to be at least a day because that's when newspapers were published every single day and some of the top magazines around the world are um, published every week or every month. And so those images have a slightly more permanent way of burning into the human consciousness. But I think when we started the project back in 2010, there is this whole idea about competing with the information that is formal and informal as well. And so when we looked at the whole topic about poverty and inequality, we asked ourselves, you know, what are those imagery and the conceptions and the impressions that we have about poverty itself and can we stay away from that? <laughs> because we wanted to create a visual that is familiar yet unfam unfamiliar in the context of the topic that we were talking about. And so uh, what we decided to do at that moment, uh, and this is not very complicated, I think it was just a matter of what is so different? And then we realize food photography is common. But food photography to be used as a way to determine food choices and limitations of what the poor would have may be different. Because it doesn't matter whether you are someone in the society living at the bottom of the pyramid or someone right at the top. If you are surviving, if you are living or even thriving, you need to eat food on a daily basis. It doesn't matter where your eggs are from. <laughs> your eggs could be um, farm raised. <laughs> it could be uh, done in a in a in a in a very humane, uh, pristine conditions, or it could be um, going through a system that is very industrial. But food is food, and it equates to survival. And even for us, using newspapers as the basis. It's the same thing. It's um, newspapers are valuable during the day that they are published, but the very next day, the newspapers lose us value very quickly. But people across strata within the society have access to both points, and that's what we decided to combine that. So that is the first explanation. Um, I, I also wanted to um, add on a part about the process is that, um, you know, as you'll see the visuals, you'll realize that we don't just focus on one or two or three particular food items. We actually construct a visual food basket. Um, and that, in a way, it, it kind of comes back to the economic framework of understanding um, cost of living, of understanding, you know, are things affordable or not? Because if you just look at one single item, um, you may be having a very skewed um, perspective because it depends um, certainly, uh, if, if something um, happens to one, one particular commodity, it doesn't mean the whole landscape changes. So what we wanted to do is to have a more balanced view, and therefore we also assembled a visual food basket, which contains um, carbohydrates um, like pasta, like um, buns, like bread, um, also proteins, um, including eggs, including meat, um, also fruits and vegetables, and, and also snacks. And so with 60 um, to 100 items per country, um, um, when you see it at that, you know, in, in the ensemble, um, it, it, it then portrays a, a more realistic understanding of the local diet, um, and also our, our concept about choice. Um, because it's not only that we uh, may assume um, for somebody to need to eat pasta um, to be full, but there are also desires um, to be fulfilled um, and aspirations 
um, to eat better tasting calories, to eat um, more nutritious calories, to eat something which um, is pleasurable. So I think all those went into that idea about constructing the food choices and the food basket. <laughs> Very impressive. And you, so to collect all this information, you were driving over 200,000 kilometers, I think, which is really a lot, over 36 countries. How did you define the, the countries you choose? Because it's 36, it could be more. What was the, what was the, frame, the framework? I think when we started out this project, um, we initially thought that this would just be a one country project. And we are based in Beijing, so naturally, you know, China was our case study. And what was, what was I think what led to this whole motivation going forward um, was a very early encounter about the work when, when we did our first case study within China. Um, there was this one week where we met some of our old friends, um, our friends who are in photojournalism and news photography, and then we showed them the work. Um, this was the first case study about China back in 2010. And the immediate reaction wasn't that, oh, this is nice, or this is interesting, but rather it was mostly negative. Um, people were looking at the work, uh, my friends, I mean, these are all friends, and then they will say, why would you do something like this? Uh, why would you disrespect the whole topic about poverty by placing this food on newspapers? How can you even eat it after that? Um, how do you ensure that the statistics are correct? And we actually felt quite disturbed and personally attacked because um, we were expecting something along the lines of, oh, this is interesting or this is nice and we leave it and and, and that's it for a day. And so we were confused. And then the next day, uh, sorry, uh, within a few days later, we met um, a curator from an art institution and we showed exactly the same work. We explained it exactly in the same way. And the reaction was like, wow, this is incredible. I've never seen something like this. And this is really interesting. So we walked out at the end of the week feeling extremely confused. We were not setting out to be artists. We set out to kind of combine the curiosity and minds and, and, and expertise between Lin and I and said, okay, maybe this is the project that we wanted to do together and maybe we can share it with some people we know. And we were not expecting people to hate it and then to love it. And I think it was that initial reaction that stays the most authentic for us because we remember how disturbing it is for some people to look at this work and feel there is something inherently disturbing about it. And I think it was that motivation that then we said, why not let's start doing this in different countries as we started traveling? And um, this also coincided um, at a time where um, I was doing two jobs. I am a commercial photographer. Mm -hmm. I'm also doing personal projects. And this coincided with a time where my commercial work gave me quite a bit of traveling opportunities. So I started traveling to different countries, uh, to different places. And so I was able to get Lynn to do the research. And in turn, she actually consulted with different economists by then to ensure that the studies and the research was kind of consistent across different countries. And so for maybe half of the countries that you see out of the 36 countries that we have went to, uh, was piggybacking on some of this commercial work and my clients were also quite understanding that I needed time off on top of this commercial work. And so it is much credit um, to them. And then at the same time, some of these countries that we felt were important, uh, we 
we went to India by ourselves. Um, we we were um, we approached a a, a um, foundation who sent us to Africa to cover part of this project as well. So I think some of these countries we felt were very important. Some of these countries kind of fell in place. But what was really interesting is that the whole idea when we did this project was we had similar conceptions as many of our friends that poverty was at its worst in some of the poorer countries. But as we went to some of these more developed, richer economy countries, we also realized that poverty is a serious problem, especially when poverty rate increases. And this whole sense of uh, inequality is not just um, difficult for the country, it can also be de destabilizing. And so that's why among the 36 countries, in fact, uh, in the last two months, we've we've added two more countries, so 38 countries and territories. Um, it is a good mix between six continents among developed and developing countries, countries that are perceived as rich and countries that are perceived as poor. And in each of these countries, poverty is a situation that is unique and a problem um, that, that, that needs to be solved but cannot be eradicated completely. Yeah, I remember as we, we spoke about uh, poverty, you associated two words, inequality, as you just mentioned, and security, uh, which was, so for you, the kind of like triptychal about the key of, uh, of poverty right now. Um, how could you, so you, Lin, you, you, you work with, with a specialist uh, in, in economy to define the criteria to select so uh, the food and that uh, every uh, that the analysis is correct. How long did you, or uh, how did you work with them? Did you define the country and from the country on you collect so data and how was it the, the process? Um, so so usually I w basically um, I would look for countries' own definitions of um, poverty and it differs from each country. Basically we're looking at two broad concepts of absolute poverty and relative poverty. Mm -hmm. um, and in a lot of um, uh, low-income economies, developing economies, um, the idea of poverty is really at an absolute um, um, level or, or extreme level um, where you're talking about survivability. And um, for example, they'll start with a basis of needing 2,400 calories a person a day to be able to work and, and survive. And from there, they've built a food budget and um, then they'll add on a non-food component. So it's really based on a very um, uh, level of survivability. Whereas for EU countries, um, um, we are looking more at a relative income level and a relative um, poverty level. And it's so it's more of an idea about um, uh, inequality and social distance. Where, for example, um, in EU, you look at um, the median um, income of a population and you take 50 or 60% of that and set that as the poverty level. Um, so basically, I, I would look at you know what is the systems um, um, that define um, um, the poverty issue, uh, issue, and how is it tracked? Um, also, what is the expenditure budgets um, patterns of households um, living in low-income areas? Um, where does a poverty perpetuate? So I'll, I'll basically build up an understanding. Um, based on the research that, that uh, that's published. Um, and when, when um, we actually do underground um, field work, um, then we collect the understanding at the ground level um, by going through the experience um, of going to the local markets, the supermarkets. So I think for me, um, I think it kind of also comes from a basis of um, in my previous work as a um, policy maker in the Singapore government, um, in I was working in the Ministry of Trade and Industry. Um, I was very much grounded by figures, um, very much grounded by you know what are the policy papers saying, what are the researchers and academics um, saying and 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 doing. Um, but I, I kind of felt that um, I, I was very much drawn also to the idea of building up a ground sense. Um, and for me, when we started this project, um, I, I also wanted um, this to have that ground sense in place so that you kind of have a macro um, view of, of understanding the issues, but at the core of it, 
um, it's really the day to day um, that matters. And 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 I think that in in our process of doing the research, it needed to bridge that part of the macro, um, the academic rigor, but also have a very strong sense on the ground of what is happening. And did you take uh, regarding the aesthetical decision to make the photographs? So, which kind of style are you going to use? Uh, what how are going to be the photographs? Was it a common decision or was it your just use of I think everything... It just to understand so how you yes. were, so I understood so mm. it's part of the rec research and it's, I think it was very clear. I think the appearance is that we seem to agree on a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact is, we don't. <laughs> and I encroach into her sense of looking at the research, and she also comes into the aesthetic decisions that um, I make. It's because I think inherently, um, the project is not about beauty. It's not about showcasing um, uh, um, a group of food items on newspapers in the most uh, attractive way possible. For her, the motivation initially when we did this is to show the food as plainly as possible so that you can kind of deduce the quantities of the food because ultimately it is the quantity of the food that you see in the newspaper that is important. Whereas I was trying to make creative decisions to make it seem interesting and very often it is very difficult to balance the two. So there lies a lot of argument that happens in between. And I think when, for the aesthetic decisions that, that we were making, because I was a little bit more trained uh, in the visual arts uh, earlier on, I was also looking at references and looking at some of this, um, uh, uh, what past masters and past influence have created for us. And I would point it to two references um, that led us to accept collectively that this is the way going forward, where this is just a top-down view, the lighting's quite even with a little of a spotlight kind of in the middle, but the food themselves are always plainly shown. And one of them would be the Beckers. Um, uh, ben and Hila Becker, um, who is a German couple who was born in the 1930s, and so um, they are very seminal work that was recently um, done as a huge uh, solo showcase at the Met Museum. Um, they photographed water towers across Germany and other parts of Europe for a good period of 20 plus, 30 years. Um, and the typological way of how they approached the subject was very attractive for me then. Um, and another aesthetic that I would say was a influence, um, uh, Tankas. So during my time uh, spent in the Himalayas, um, I saw a lot of Tankas uh, in the Tibetan region, in the Nepali region. And, um, and these are Tankas and Mandalas that are painted in very detailed um, sequences by artisans. And it always looks round and it looks very symmetrical. And then when you wonder what it is, it's actually the top-down view of a stupa, of a temple. And, and what is really interesting about the, the, the idea of a stupa is that when you look at it, it denotes peace. But at the same time, it is also a blueprint of an architectural drawing which gives you information on top of, um, of a feeling that most viewers feel a sense of um, um, spiritual connection. But what inherently it is, is about the beauty, about design, about symmetry, about balance. And so when we created the work, I consciously looked at the first influence, which is uh, the Beckers, and you met, I think, uh, Ila, you told me. Sorry? You had a meeting with Ila Becker. Yes. Yeah. And I met Hila Becker before she passed in Beijing. And it was such an incredible honor uh, meeting her and also showing her 
the work, the exhibition, it was our first exhibition uh, back in China, back in 2012. And, uh, and the second influence that I mentioned about the stupas didn't occur to me. It was not a conscious uh, decision. I don't think that that was in my mind when we created this. But then I brought my daughter uh, together to the Everest Base Camp when she was three years old. And we were inside a old stupa. Uh, sorry, we were inside a old temple. And she was pointing to some of these paintings. And she was t asking me what this is about, the mandalas. And I explained, well, it's a drawing of a temple from above. And that's when I realized that all the years that I've been spending in the Himalayas, climbing as a mountaineer, you have all these subconscious um, impressions that is burned into you, you know? You, you, uh, when, when I was a climber, when I asked people who had done it before me, I said, does climbing the mountains change you? And then they say, absolutely, but you wouldn't know what are the changes that have made you. So, so you can see that the aesthetic um, uh, reasoning behind was a combination of conscious and subconscious influences. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, maybe what would be interesting is to know how this works, this over 10 years uh, work, so was a kind of uh, beginning also for what follow. So we we just like, uh, uh, we talk about uh, um, fish footprint, but maybe could you ex explain maybe a little bit like your, your process to go after this uh, body of work to another one or to, to start to something else? Or how was it so important? Um, I think I think doing the poverty line work um, and gaining an audience um, when we showed at exhibitions and we saw the connection that the work was having with, with people who visited the exhibitions um, from, from people who, who come from um, different backgrounds and different ages. Uh, we saw the power of photography and, and the visual um, in, in connecting people. And, and so that really excited us. We wanted to kind of also experiment, um, open up our concept um, more uh, to see where could we where could we build this uh, visual connection further? Um, so the ecological footprint of fish, um, that uh, equivalence, the ecological footprint of fish was actually a um, probably the second work that we did. And that, that was a little bit more conceptual um, because we, we decided um, with the poverty line, um, there is a very strict boundary or a rule, a guide um, to say, okay, it's based on how much per person per day um, you will be able to afford um, based on a certain calculation um, and, uh, and, 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 and um, kind of populating um, that whole um, paradigm. So, so it's a little bit more um, bounded, but with the ecological footprint of fish, um, we, we started releasing a little bit more of creative um, openness um, to, and basically that project was about looking at the impact of fish farming. Um, and we look at a specific species of fish in China, which is called the large yellow crocker, and the, f the, the ecological impact of it when it's being farmed um, and how, how much um, basically um, feed fish it needs to eat um, to be able to attain a market size. And so with that, um, it, it really, it, it started with um, being research-based, um, but we, we kind of um, use that visual language um, to look at the individual um, lives and, and, and um, ecological um, species that were being impacted in, in a larger network. Um, so just to describe it, because we don't have the slide to show what it is, is uh, we calculated the amount of fish that it takes to feed farm fish. And so we took three of this farm fish, which weighs one kilo, and we worked with scientists to examine the amount of fish that it takes to grow them to a market size. And the answer is, I think it was like around 60 species and 4,000 fishes. And so we photographed them individually, and we created a tessellated body of work. And this work has been showcased in a few uh, venues, and typically the work stretches across 15 meters, and about, um, uh, about 1.5 to 2 meters um, in width. So 
it is all showcase life size. When you go closer to the fish, it looks exactly as you would see a fish in a market. But reality often surprises us because when you take a step back, then you realize that the gravity of consumer choices, and again, this is not about pointing fingers at anyone apart from us humans ourselves. <laughs> because um, we visited the fish farmers. They were making a living as hard as they could, and they were also pressured by the economy. And this is a way which is healthy, because uh, the alternative would be to use chemicals or to use industrial feed. And what they are doing is good on certain factors, but then ultimately it is also not sustainable. So I think um, this topic itself is we raise a difficult question with answers that are also not very easy. But I think as artists, sometimes um, as far as what we would like to do is to offer solutions, sometimes I think the questions themselves would also lead to some very serious discussion um, surrounding that itself. Yeah, I think what was very impressive, I, I completely agree, because it's you were really surprised when you were looking at the, at the, at the piece with like so much element, so, and you had to come closer just to realize what it means. And uh, sure, it's not pointing something, it's like just uh, bringing maybe everyone to think what it means when you, when you produce so much and when you consume. Uh, but... Um, Maybe what could be maybe interesting is like to ask if in the public there is any question because you you were you gave us already a lot of information. Uh, you had the opportunity to to look at the book. Uh, hello, uh, thank you for the presentation. I missed the beginning, so maybe you spoke about that at the beginning. I was wondering if you consider in, in your consideration about poverty, you took at some point the lens of gender because women in the world are so much poorer. So it's like a really a very strong difference. Does it appear somewhere? I mean, have you used that lens at some point in the work? Um, we, we don't specifically um, uh, put that in the work, but I think um, it's very important, the role of women. Um, in society, but it differs from the social structures of, of each country, and therefore the contextualization of it um, is important as well. Um, what we have found is that uh, we, we are kind of basing, we, we are basing our calculations um, on the policies, and very often the policies are agnostic to gender in terms of who is defined as poor. It, it boils down to a certain amount of money, and it doesn't it doesn't differ whether the head of a household is a female or a male, unfortunately. Um, that, that is the case which the policy is, is, is set. And so therefore we use that definition and we point back but using a visual representation of that policy definition. And I think in the end for, for, for the audience um, to engage in the work and to think, is this, is this how is the policy to be viewed um, within the lens of that society, within the lens of that political um, um, perspective and, and expectations? Um, and we want to have that conversation. Um, so that, that is um, one, 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 one um, uh, aspect of that visual. Um, the other thing is that we realize certainly when we go to the markets and, and supermarkets to purchase the food items, women are a very important part of the household um, um, in making decisions on purchases. Uh, for food, um, especially for families. And therefore, it is very difficult um, um, in, 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 in a lot of places when women are having uh, multiple roles um, in the family as well as um, um, in, you know, uh, um, within uh, income generation um, to hold, job, hold down jobs when they are also expected um, to cook for the family. And that leads to also certain situations where you may not get as nutritious meals because the woman is trying to handle 
um, cooking for the family or, or having enough food on the table by using certain convenience foods and so on. So I think it's a complex issue when we talk about the role of gender, um, the role of women um, within the family context, within the household purchasing decision, and how do we broaden um, the understanding of these issues which surround um, poverty um, and, and uh, circumstance. So I think, yeah, so, so <laughs> that's, that's a kind of a long answer, but I think it, um, the doing the, the work itself and kind of observing um, the social structure uh, when we visit the places um, and, and do our own research um, certainly highlights to us on the importance of gender. Thank you. Was it um, an answer for you? <laughs> You see the numbers of the, for instance, the IMF, like the, the International Monetary Fund, who makes analysis of poverty on the planet. They show that, for instance, women own 10% of global ownership, whether, you know, real estate, goods, uh, financial properties, any all pop from all pop. So it's like 10% is owned by women, and it's like really a dramatic number. I, I, I saw that number quite recently and I was really shocked because, I mean, we're aware that women make less money, are more exposed to precarity, poverty, but that number just struck me, 10 persons. I mean, it's half of the population of the, and I think it's it could be uh, an information to show, something to show in a project like yours, mm. but, um, that's why I'm asking the question to drop that idea and that information in the debate as well. Yes. Yeah. I mean to. I mean, thanks for that question because I think it's a it's a very important um, question. Um, I think when we address when we started the poverty line, we do realize that we are not able to cover all bases. Um, so in the in the project that we do, um, I think when we before we even started taking our first photograph. Uh, I remember Lynn started emailing different economists to just get an understanding if a project like this would even be agreeable with different economists. Because um, it is one thing to say, okay, uh, let's decide among ourselves and let's create this project and, 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 and let's just run with it. Um, Lynn was actually doing preparation work. Um, and, and looking back, this is, this is uh, really important because um, I think that when she started doing the research, she wanted it to be more or less agreeable. Like, like you can never get 100% uh, um, agreement from, from any faction and you certainly cannot cover all bases with the project that we were doing. Um, I mean, one of the critiques that we often get is that our project do not show poor people. Uh, and our project also do not show the conditions of all these countries because I have physically gone to every country and uh, each of these places. But then, even then, we also realize that um, uh, some of the critique that we sometimes get is that, well, in the USA, you are doing this in New York, but New York is not USA. And just the same as when we were doing this in China, we were doing this in Beijing. And again, you know, Beijing only is the home of 20 million people in China, and there's 1.3 billion, of which about half of them live in the rural areas. And so there is, um, there are um, assumptions that we have to make, and we actually make that very clear in the work that we do, including even showing the month where the project is conducted, because um, seasonality, also determines on how food prices would fluctuate within um, a year itself. Um, but in my own experience, you know, going onto the ground and photographing um, the poverty line, I also encounter people. And I think one of the biggest learning that we actually have is that we think that poverty is something that you can see. When, 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 so I will, I will use one um, example. Uh, I was in LA. I wasn't doing the poverty line there, but I had some friends who knew the project that I was doing. And I met a professor of photography. 
and I was explaining the project to her, and I was explaining what methodology we were doing, and then she asked me, she's like, what is the food budget that a poor person would have in a single day in America during this time? And I said, well, based on our calculations, it's about $5 US. And she's like, is that for a meal or for one day? I said, that's for one day, depending on how many meals you eat. I mean, based on our own research, a poor person would not have three meals a day. They would usually have less. And then um, she also asked, it's like, well, that's what I spend for food. And then suddenly we were having lunch and I looked across and I said, wait, are you telling me something that I wasn't expecting? And she's like, um, what's the income level that you are looking at that is con uh, defined as poor? And when I told her, she's like, yes, I am living at the poverty line. And so this was very curious for me because I was meeting a professor of photography and she was a former printer for Magnum. So she used to print prints for Magnum uh, agency. And so this led me to be very curious about asking her, I said, wait, your CV, your experience, everything that I know about you, don't tell me that you are poor. But now you are telling me across the table that you agree with our findings because you are living at those conditions. And then she explained, yes, I was a ex-printer. I'm no longer a printer. I am a professor, but I only work a day a week. I don't lecture full time. And I have a mortgage, I have a car, but then when I work out all my expenses, this is what I have left. And this is my day-to-day -day expenses. And so, yes, I am structurally poor. And this was surprising for me, but again, when we look back at some of the numbers that we have in the project itself, is that the poverty line does not connote homelessness. It does not connote um, being destitute. In fact, the poverty line is an income level where anything below this level, you are defined as poor. But at the level itself, it almost appears sometimes that you are the same as everyone else. And that's when we realized one of the biggest conclusions from the Poverty Line Project itself is that very often we assume that poverty is something you see. But in fact, it is very often invisible because people can have an education, they could have a job, they could even have a roof over their heads. But due to circumstances, it could be household size being too big, or you have people to support, or you are working in a structurally minimum wage job for a long time, and somehow those wage have not increased. And we are not just talking about countries like America, we are also talking like countries in Japan, um, in Cambodia, and, and, and different parts around the world. So what we realized is that when we created the poverty line, the whole impression that we have about the poor is something that we feel we can see. But very often, it's not something we can see. And that's why it has become such a problem when we started the project back in 2010. We remember that poverty wasn't a sexy topic. I mean, even today, it's, it's not. It's still not a topic that is very much discussed. But in this 13 years that has passed since, the Wall Street protests, the protests in Paris. Um, people talk about um, um, uh, common prosperity within China itself, you know? Um, so every continent seems to be going through this whole cycle about discussing what to do and how to contain this problem or to at least keep it minimal. And I think that's the reason. And, and this is just a problem that will become bigger as technology improves. Because as technology improves, you will have people who will gain from this system, and then you will have people who is left behind. And these people, they, are, they have done all the things that are the right decisions in life, but somehow they have been left behind by the system.
And this is something that we realize is happening. Yeah, thank you very much. I think it, it was a very nice conclusion. If there is any other question, maybe we we are going to close this discussion, if it's fine with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so with regards to the with regards to the book, um, so we so the book is published in two languages, French by Hector Sud yeah. and English by Lance Muller, and um, we actually know that the French edition is selling quite well, <laughs> so we were not able to get copies over here for sale, but you can find them. It, it can be ordered online and then it'll be delivered. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So within uh, Europe, the, they do have French version and English version that you can order online. Oh, you could go <laughs> to uh, Actors Suit Bookshop yeah. and then <laughs> it's also maybe nice when you discover something else. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank, you thank, you. Yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.